Hello and welcome to the Prepping with Darren podcast. First of all, I would like to apologize. I know that whenever I started with the podcast, I did intend it to be a weekly podcast, but that didn't work out. I had a death in the family, and ever since then, things have just been kind of snowballing downhill from there. I will, for now on, try to make it at least a every other week podcast. This week, I wanted to talk about what I think is a very likely SHTF situation, scenario. The likelihood of a, a CME, although it's not really necessarily rare, it's just it doesn't happen every week. But, but the possibility of it actually doing quite a bit of damage to us if we get a full full hit with it is actually pretty bad. You may or may not know the, well, the CME stands for coronal mass ejection. The Carrington event back in 1859, uh, it wasn't the most powerful one, but it was the most powerful one that was able to be recorded just before noon on September 1st of 1859. Uh, two astronomers, two astro- astronomers, Richard Carrington and Richard Hod- Hodgson, can't pronounce that very well, uh, independently made the first observation of a solar flare. The flare was associated with a a major CME, or coronal mass ejection, that traveled uh, directly towards Earth. It took around 17 and a half hours to make the 93 million mile trip to Earth. Typically, it takes a couple of days for a CME to arrive, but the, uh, the power of this one was way up there, and it, it came pretty, pretty quick. On September 1st and 2nd, the auroras were seen around the world. Those in the northern hemisphere, as far as as far south as the Caribbean, and those over the Rocky Mountains in the U.S. were so bright that the glow actually woke up some gold miners. They thought the sun was coming up, so they got up, and started making breakfast. But uh, the te- tele- telegraph systems all over uh, Europe and North America failed. Some of them, some of the operators even got shocked. But the basically the wires just burned up. Some of them could even still receive the uh, messages despite not having the power anymore for the telegraph systems. There were some less severe uh, storms, uh, solar storms, that have occurred uh, in the 1900s, uh, 1921, 1960. Those had actually disrupted the radio waves. The, there was a solar storm, 1989. It took out power across. Quebec, well, uh, large large sections of Quebec. The solar storm that hit in 1989 actually caused a nine-hour nine hour power outage at the uh, Quebec's electrical transmission system, hydro. The geomagnetic storm causing this event uh, on uh, in March of 89 was itself the result of a of an ejection. Known as the known as a coronal mass ejection CME, which happened on the uh, March 9th, a couple days beforehand, uh, a few days before on March 6th, a very large X15 class solar flare was was occurring. Uh, three and a half days later, at, at around 2:44 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, on March 13th, a severe geomagnetic storm struck Earth. The storm began with some uh, pretty intense auroras, uh, pretty intense stuff at the at the poles. The auroras could be seen as far south as Texas and Florida. And actually, on, on July twenty third, twenty twelve, a Carrington class solar uh, solar superstorm, or basically, it was a another CME that was just as powerful as a Carrington. Well, the Carrington event was it, it was it was found discovered, but the uh, the trajectory from it to Earth at the time that we were spinning around in the orbit was I think it was about two weeks. If if it would have been a direct hit, we would have been pretty well screwed. The eruption tore through Earth's orbit, hitting the Stereo A spacecraft. The, the spacecraft is a solar obser- uh, observatory equipped to measure such activity. And because it was far away from Earth, and that's not exposed to the strong electrical currents that it 
that can be induced with the CM when a CMA hits the Earth's magnetic sphere, magnet magnetosphere, and survived the encounter and provided researchers with pretty valuable data. Based on the collected data, the eruption consisted of two separate ejections, which were able to reach uh, exceptionally high strength as an interplanetary medium around the sun had been uh, it had been cleared by a smaller CME four days later. Had the CME hit the Earth, it is uh, very likely that it would have inflicted serious damage to the uh, electrical power systems on a, on a global scale. A uh, 2013 study estimated that the economic that the economic cost to the U.S. would have been between uh, uh, 0.6 and 2.6 trillion dollars. That's a lot of money. I mean, think about how far in debt we are right now, as it is as a nation, and and, and it's not just us; it's you know globally. Everybody isn't debt anymore. But Ying Di Liu, a professor at China State Key Laboratory of Space Weather. Estimated that the recovery time from such a disaster would have been about four to ten years. If you think about it, uh, think about this for a minute. What do we all do on a daily basis that isn't somehow connected with power? You know, you, you, do you drive a car? If so, then the gas that you burn is able to get pumped into your gas tank with electricity. Also, it's hauled by tanker trucks or uh, train rails, but how do they get their fuel? They pump their fuel with electricity. Unless they're on the, those electrical powered trucks, but those don't really seem to pan out very well. There's too much weight with the battery packs and stuff. I'm sure they'll figure it out one day. But um, also think of this. How is it that cities have become so populated? Well, advancements in, in, advancements in technology. Used to in cities, well, used to in the cities, they would actually have the you know livestock there. People would raise their own uh, chickens, goats, uh, cows, stuff like that. They they have their own crops, and their garden and stuff. You don't do that anymore in the cities. Now some of them are starting to do that to where they will like community gardens or you know just gardens in general in your backyard or front yard. Uh, some HOAs, I guess, are kind of against that, but you just kind of gotta find out what you're rules are with your with your HOA if you have one yeah uh, without power you have no lights no fuel no water treatment no water pumped to your house in the, in the summer you wouldn't have no cold air but some of that wouldn't be too bad but most of the US it gets pretty pretty toasty <laughs> you wouldn't have no, no communication you would have uh, it's about two to three days on cell phone towers they have backups uh, backup powers but if it's if that's taken out as well, it, you know, it's just kind of done for. There are things that you can do that it's not really 100% proven that it will actually work, but uh, a Faraday cage. A lot of people are talking about those. With something that powerful, I don't know if it would actually work. There are some companies, private sectors, that are testing stuff like that. I don't know, the, a lot of the military-grade stuff that is... Uh, highly tested because if something like that were to happen they would need to still be able to communicate but uh, as far as civilians uh, there are some things out there to get that are EMP proof but as far as the CME it it's kind of a different uh, there were no like not really a different kind of electricity it's just like kind of like different uh, jolt I guess whatever uh, for those with the uh, diabetes you know you, you have to take insulin well the insulin has to stay cool and uh, without power how are you gonna be able to keep it cool I mean in the winter time it wouldn't be bad you know just covered up with snow An another way you could it might work out decent is like a you know, a walk-in fridge, an underground fridge. That is something that I have kind of thought about doing sometime, but it, it'll be years from now. Yeah, a, uh, a Carrington event like CME would uh, would take out the power grid on a global scale. I'm sure you're thinking, well, that wouldn't be too bad. Uh, they can just replace the transformers and substations. 
Well, I mean, they can, but the uh, yeah, you know, when they started building substations, there was no standardized way of constructing them. Uh, so each each substation is different in its own. With that being said, how long do you think it would take to replace the substations? Well, it, it takes around a year to construct one of the transformers for one substation. Then they usually bring them overseas uh, with a barge. Then you got to truck it to the substation. Then you got to have cranes and all that stuff to lift it and move it and get it put in place. Well, there's around 7,000 power plants here in the U.S. and there's about 55,000 substations throughout the U.S. So you think it takes one year to build to put together uh, one of these transformers for the substation but uh and, that, and that's in today's times you know when we have electricity but if a event like that were, were to happen we would be in a bad bad shape because we wouldn't have the the power tools everything would have to be done by hand uh, and transportation, you know, that wouldn't be very likely because, you know, you might be able to get, if you got two full tanks, maybe, maybe six, seven hundred miles. I think that's about what I got, two full tanks, about six, seven hundred miles. And another thing that uh, is really kind of terrifying, if, if you think about it, the, the nuclear power plants, although they are able to, you know, get shut down, you still got to deal with the heat decay if you're not able to keep it cool with the use of pumps to pump the water in and out then the heat decay will become too much it'll start degrading and you'll have a, a, a reactor meltdown from the fuel rods and uh, although there are quite a bit of safeguards in place you still wouldn't want to be right next to one uh, I know that they say you want to live at least 50 miles away from a, a nuclear power plant, but I say that the better, the, the, the farther you're away, the farther that you are away from one, the better. I try and say at least 100, 100 plus miles away from one. Although, you know, the nuclear power plants are much more environmentally friendly as opposed to coal plants, but uh, the dangers of them in the event of a CME was, you know, it, it, it's pretty bad. Uh, as it is right now, the uh, the spent fuel rods take anywhere from five to ten years to cool down enough to where it will stop the heat decay, which is what releases the radiation. Uh, so that's that's you know five to ten years of constant cooling with you know water pumps that pumps the water in and out, cycles it through and keeps it cool, and you know. That ain't gonna do very well, you know. Look at uh, uh, what was it? I mean, look look at uh, Fukushima, for example. Look how fast it took for that to go into meltdown, you know. Although it, they did kind of not do what they were supposed to as far as the safety precautions, but um, it didn't take very long for it to go into full meltdown. And you know, and, and that's why I say to at least be 100 miles away from a nuclear plant. As far as if you're going to, if you're going to be buying a house, and there are some uh, there are some ways to determine that. I'll actually be in, in the show notes. I'll link the article that uh, you're able to check the distance, uh, well, the, the air distance from the nuclear power plants. If you're looking to buy a house somewhere, this is why they say. Well, not a lot of people, but uh, uh, one doctor. I'll actually link to that as well. I did an article about it not too long ago, but um, that's why they're saying that uh, you know the die-off rate would be about ninety percent of the population here in the states. That's just here in the states. That's not everywhere else. If all if all the plants were to go into meltdown, because uh, ninety percent of the population lives within fifty miles of nu nuclear power plant. M most of it's out of the east east coast and stuff, but uh, you know out west and Midwest, you don't really have a a lot of people as you know as far as the populations go that they have been shutting down old reactors but there are still quite a few that are active uh, another thing I did want to mention was the possibility of an EMP uh, you know another country hitting us with an EMP 
it's, it's around 14, 15 years ago now, uh, Russia sold uh, the information to North Korea on how to actually build a, a super EMP bomb. Although I don't feel that, I don't, I don't see that as destructive as a CME. They can still do some damage if they know where to, to detonate it at. You know, also another thing, uh, the power grid is constantly under attack by hackers. That's been going on ever since, you know, computers. <laughs> uh, but that's another thing that take into effect is, you know, the possibility of that happening. I know in uh, American Blackout, yeah, American Blackout, the movie, uh, you can actually see it on YouTube. I couldn't find it on Netflix, but I know they got it on YouTube. Um, if, if you haven't watched that yet, go ahead and get, give that a give that a watch and uh, let me know what you think. I hope you have enjoyed this podcast, uh, well, this week's podcast on the dangers of CMEs. Uh, don't forget to check us out on Facebook. And if you haven't yet, go ahead and subscribe at, for the newsletter at preppingwithdarren.com forward slash subscribe. The show notes will be found at uh, preppingwithdarren.com forward slash E002. Thank <laughs> you.